Youth homelessness is a serious issue in BC. Tonight, a new report shows young people are becoming homeless at alarming rates. It's basically the, the, the relationship of these women as they sort of navigate what's happening outside the fort. And a look at an award-winning play on the fur trade. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. And I'm Melissa Ridgen. For the first time in nearly a month, commuter trains are once again running between Ottawa and Toronto. Via Rail says that partial service has resumed between the two cities. 940 trains have been cancelled since service was shut down on February 7th, impacting more than 160,000 passengers. And CN Rail says it's starting to call back most of the 450 workers it temporarily laid off due to the blockades. The company says the disruption cost them scores of millions of dollars. The Mohawks of Ganawage near Montreal say their rail blockade will continue and they have no deadline to take it down. A uh, decision does have to uh, be made soon as to what's going to happen, whether you know, the decision is going to be to stay on the tracks or to uh, do something else, you know, that's going to be up to them too. The decision to maintain the blockade was made during a meeting with community members last night. Mohawk leaders say they'll have to consider how their people feel about the blockade and what other protesters are doing around the country before they can move forward. Just ahead of International Women's Day and the upcoming World March of Women, Vivian Michelle, president of the Quebec Native Women, was one of several women who held a press conference today to remind the province of promises unfulfilled. According to Michelle, there's much ground still to be covered after the release of two Quebec-specific inquiry reports last year. She says Indigenous women in Quebec are still subjected to racial stereotyping, forced sterilization and daily feelings of insecurity and are not alone in their calls for better government support of women. L'important d'avoir de, des alliés non autochtones, je pense que ça solidifie les luttes que l'on mène, les revendications que l'on apporte. Et en même temps, euh, peu importe de quelle origine on est, qu'on soit autochtone, non autochtone, et avec les autres euh, origines ethniques, on a des enjeux similaires. Justin Trudeau was in Halifax today to announce federal funding to help young people get jobs. But the media wanted to hear from Trudeau about another national issue. Trudeau said that just under $500 million will be spent on over 270 projects across Canada to help people transition into jobs. But the media and APTN was more interested in the Liberals' handling of the Wet'suwet'en conflict. Hello, Mr. Trudeau. My name is Angel Moore, and I'm with APTN National News. What message does it send to Indigenous people and Canadians that it took ni nationwide protests and blockades for the Wet'suwet'en Nation to get a tentative deal on rights and titles? Uh, we have actually been working with the Wet'suwet'en for a number of years now. We signed a uh, landmark agreement on child and family services with them about two years ago. Uh, the BC government has been working very closely with them on rights and title. Uh, over uh, the past uh, number of years as well, and there has been much progress made. Several First Nations in Northern Ontario say the province failed to consult them on a new agreement that could link them to mining areas via an all-season road. Martin Falls and Webequay signed the road agreement with Premier Doug Ford at the annual Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada conference in Toronto this week. It's hoped that the agreement will pave the way to jobs and prosperity for all nine First Nations in the region, which is dubbed the Ring of Fire. But most of the bands are not happy with the agreement and the issue made its way into the provincial legislature. Saul Mamakwa is the opposition NDP's Indigenous Relations critic. Agreements for all season roads with these communities existed for three years, but Ontario delayed the existing working relationship with all First Nations across the region by terminating the regional framework agreement. That was a step backwards that further delayed 
the infrastructure needed for the Ringer fire development. This is a multi, multi-billion dollar opportunity. Again, not, not just for the, the two First Nations community up there, but First Nations communities right across this great province. We're going to be working with them shoulder to shoulder, standing up, making sure that we get a road to prosperity built and give them a better opportunity. We have to, we have to understand development in the far north does not happen without free, prior, and informed consent of all communities affected. Well, we want to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. A Nunavut teacher who left the territory in 2013 after several allegations of sexual assault on students is now banned from teaching in Ontario. Mark Anthony Kane was a teacher at Iqaluit's Middle School in 2013. He was charged with three counts of sexual interference due to complaints from students. Those charges were later stayed, but Kane lost his job as a Nunavut teacher. Now the Ontario College of Teachers have found him guilty of professional misconduct including sexual, verbal and physical abuse. In addition to no longer being able to teach in Ontario, Kane also had to pay a $25,000 fine. Late last week, an Alberta school for junior and senior high students was put in a hold and secure situation. The school is home to many Indigenous students. APTN's Chris Stewart explains. On February 22nd, Pinoka RCMP were sent to a disturbance. They found two groups of youth in what they called an altercation. Twelve males were arrested and five were charged. Three adult males and two youth were charged with offenses such as mischief, uttering threats and possession of a weapon. All five were released with conditions. This past Friday, three adults and one youth were also charged with similar offenses. A video on social media last week which shows what appears to be three white youth swearing and making threats to indigenous people. One of the youth says, I'll scalp you this time. The Wolf Creek Public School Board put the Pinocchio Secondary Campus on hold and secure on Friday for precautionary reasons. A hold and secure is when the building is locked and no one is prevented to enter or leave. RCMP confirmed the hold and secure was related to the February 22nd altercation. The RCMP say they are still looking for another suspect. I spoke to some of the students and told me that they were embarrassed by the content of the video and that it hurts their school's reputation. I also spoke to a member of Moscatees whose students go to the school. She did not want to go on camera but says she is worried about the safety of the children at the school. The RCMP, they do not want to see any retaliation or vigilante actions by anyone. Five of the charged make their first court appearance on April 17th. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Still to come, the number of youth ending up on the streets in Vancouver continues to rise. But first, a look at Wednesday's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, plus eight with showers for Charlottetown, five above and rain in St. John's. Sunny and minus seven for Nain, two below for Happy Valley Goose Bay, plus two in Montreal, snow in Saguenay with a high of two, plus five in Toronto, snow and plus two in Ottawa. Zero for Thunder Bay, sunny and three below in Sioux Lookout. Minus 17 for Churchill, minus four in Norway House and Thompson. Minus one with a rain-snow mix for Winnipeg, Gimli, Princess Harbor and Barron's River. Plus one with snow for Saskatoon, four above in Regina. Minus six in Stony Rapids, zero for Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. A new report from the Representative for Children and Youth in British Columbia shows young people are becoming homeless at alarming rates. APTN's Tina House has that story. Catherine McParland is the author of this new report entitled From Marginalized to Magnified. McParland grew up in care and after aging out she also became homeless. She worked with a cohort of young people to develop the report. It's cold, dark, and the snow is falling. Your feet are numb, 
with fingers like icicles. You need a place to be warm. Your tummy rumbles as you try and remember the last time you ate. Loneliness sets in as you remember loved ones from the past. Those words are the stark reality for those that are homeless, surviving any way they can with makeshift shelters or living in tent cities like this one. According to the representative for children and youth, Jennifer Charlesworth, young people leaving government care are more likely to become homeless if not given the proper supports. Youth homelessness is a serious issue in BC and young people who are in government care or receiving services or living in poverty are some of the most vulnerable to experiencing homelessness due to the trauma and the displacement and the experiences that they've had thus far in their young lives. The report sheds light on the root causes of youth homelessness such as no support after aging out and the many barriers youth face. McParland hopes the testimonies from youth in her report will be listened to by government. The report we are releasing today magnifies the voices of marginalized youth to ensure their expertise is heard. It recommends that the government listen to these voices and put in place a provincial plan to end youth homelessness by January 2021. First Nations Leadership Council member Robert Phillip says the timeline is very ambitious, but he's encouraging all levels of government, industry and organizations to join the discussion. If we all work together, we can address and move forward to tackle this issue of homelessness uh, for the youth. So in that discussion, the action items and then work on them to complete them. We might not be able to get all of it done, but I think if we tackle it one by one, then we can address it. If we can get one kid off the street, if we can get one person that have a home, I think that's a job well done. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. A senior on the Pagani Nation, about 200 kilometers south of Calgary, says that some elderly residents are facing deplorable and unsafe living conditions, while the band focuses on building new homes for other band members. In an effort to tackle a housing crisis, the Pagani Nation set out to build 150 new homes over the past four years, but Susan Coldweather says other residents have been left waiting for badly needed repairs. CTV's Terry Vote reports. It's deploring. Susan Coldweather says her sister's house may look okay. It's the smell. But has some major problems, including a broken sewer pipe under the bathroom. You could see it all there, uh, the moisture and the dampness of the water going down. So it technically is not pouring anywhere but underneath the ground. And there are other concerns too. With little insulation under the home, the water pipes are prone to freezing, forcing her sister and brother-in-law to move out and rent a motel room when it gets too cold outside. Everything's frozen and she can't use the washrooms, they can't run the water, so they're, they, they can't even cook. Susan's house also needs work. The band started renovations in November of 2018, but the job was never finished. This is how it was left. Uh, they never finished fixing it. Now the inside drywall is cracking and moisture is leaking inside. They told me that they would supply, supply us with our own material so we could uh, fix it ourselves, only to find out that uh, Pagan Housing has absolutely no money. And while the band provides clean drinking water every week, Susan and her husband are forced to buy bottled water because their cistern was improperly built and is easily contaminated. That's the other frustrating part, you know. Every year, every year we have to have, we have to deal with water contamination and nothing's done. We attempted to contact Bigani Housing, who directed us to a member of band council, but so far we have not received a response. In recent years, the band has been working hard to address their housing crisis, with a plan to build 150 new homes over a four-year period. But Susan says they also need to show support and compassion for the elders. It's unacceptable that, you know, they continue to ignore us and think, you know, we're not important. Terry Vote, CTV News, on the Bikani Nation. We often hear about Indigenous people's opposition to resource development. 
But the resource sector remains one of the largest employers of Indigenous peoples, and more are looking to get involved. On a new episode of Face to Face tonight, our guest Stephen Buffalo says it just makes sense for some Indigenous communities to participate in the oil and gas sector. For Western Canada, you can't help the fact that, you know, the oil and gas is around us. You know, and, it, and it's, it, given our circumstance, I, I think it's warranted that we participate. You know, uh, as, as we continue forward, 643 First Nations will not see very much increase in the federal funding under the Indian Act. So we have to find a different way. And eco the economic development is probably our only way. And, and for some of the communities, it, it's, it's being involved in the sector. And you can catch that episode of Face to Face right here after the news. Coming up, how the Arctic Winter Games is preparing for the coronavirus. Stay with us. Piggy back up in northern Alberta, plus one for Fort McMurray and Peace River. Eight above in Medicine Hat, plus 11 for Lethbridge. Plus nine under sunny skies in Vancouver, Penticton and Campbell River. Minus 7 in Fort Nelson, plus 3 for Smithers. Minus 24 in Old Crow, 6 below with snow in Whitehorse. Minus 20 in snow in Yellowknife, 26 below for Norman Wells. Minus 33 for Saks Harbor, 31 below in Politak, minus 30 in Colville Lake. Minus 30 in Cambridge Bay with snow, 25 below for Chesterfield. Minus 30 in Aglulik. 38 below in Resolute. Welcome back. Residents of George Gordon First Nation are requesting financial assistance for members dealing with mental health issues in relation to the day school compensation application forms. CTV reporter Allison McKinnon has more. Standing in this building brings back pain-filled memories for Eddie Bitternose and Frank Sear. There's a classroom on this side, a classroom here, a classroom down there. Almost 60 years ago, the two men attended what was then known as the Gordon Day School. It was so bad in school by um, being abused and uh, you couldn't say nothing because you're treated worse than the residential school kids. If you said anything, then you're, you just got it worse. Nearly 200,000 Indigenous children attended Canadian day schools since the 1920s, where many endured physical and sexual abuse. The schools were similar to a residential school, except kids were allowed to go home at the end of the day. In January, the federal government announced day school survivors could apply for financial compensation, and for some, the applications are daunting. We have to uh, get our own members to, to help our, uh, our uh, people with uh, mental health problems, with some of the abuse they deal with. I believe that our people deserve more than being dealt with through a 1-800 number. George Gordon First Nation housed two day schools and applying for compensation has proven to be complicated. Because we went to this white school, we're day school students. But if we went to this, uh, this school and we went home every day, and they're in the same yard, then we're, we're day scholars. We went home, we came in the morning and we went home in the afternoon. I don't know what the difference is. Residents have been told in order to qualify for compensation, they had to attend an approved day school between 1968 and 92. Those who attended before have to wait until another class action makes its way through the courts. Well, many of our mem older members will not be around to, to uh, benefit, and, and I think they deserve because they were the same boat as everybody else. Now, the structure behind me is actually one of the schools involved in many of these cases, and both the chief and those survivors who once upon a time went to school here are hoping that their pleas will be heard by the government. Allison McKinnon, CTV News, George Gordon, First Nation. With 29 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada, the Yukon government says they are taking all necessary precautions to prevent an outbreak during the 2020 Arctic Winter Games in Whitehorse. 
At this time, there are no cases of the coronavirus in the Yukon. The territory's chief, chief medical officer says they'll be monitoring the situation, but so far, no communities from any of the Arctic countries that will be taking part in the games have seen a spread of the virus. Dr. Catherine Elliott says that during the games, people who are sick should avoid close contact with people and should stay home. In Yukon, we're really excited to host the Arctic Winter Games, and we're conducting risk assessment to make sure we can make it the safest. Everybody in Yukon, whether they're a traveler or a local person, has that responsibility to stay home when they're sick, and if they get sick, to keep that illness away from other people. We want to keep the Arctic Winter Games healthy, exciting, and a wonderful international event. It won the Toronto Fringe's Best New Play Award in 2018, and now a new version of Women of the Fur Trade premiered in Winnipeg. APTN's Daryl Stranger gives us an inside look at the performance, which follows three 19th century women as they navigate the rapidly changing world of the fur trade. Women of the Fur Trade shifts between past and present, and the performers use 21st century slang to share their views on life, love, and Louis Riel. It's basically the... the the relationship of these women as they sort of navigate what's happening outside the fort, which is, um, you know, Louis Riel is, is leading a resistance and uh, navigating their lives inside the fort, which is basically they are feeling confined by their roles as women and what that means and how they eventually try to break out of that. Frances Concan is the playwright who was from Kuchiching First Nation in Ontario and now lives in Winnipeg. She hopes her play shines light on an important time in history, which is still relevant today. Things just keep happening in the news that would relate and that would um, mirror things that happened in the writing. And I think that just sort of points to a universality of the story and of what we're writing and, and how time is cyclical and events keep happening and will keep continuing until we stand up and make a change. The performers hope people walk away entertained but also enlightened. Manitoba and Winnipeg has a very um, convoluted relationship with how they feel about Louis Riel. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but I think that it will make them think about that, but I think it will also make them think about how, how they live their own lives and how those issues and those things that were happening back then are still happening now. This is actually the land where all of this, even though it's about the past, th this has taken place, and we're still working through a lot of this today. So I just want people, when they come to see the show, to recognize where they are and, and how they can be accountable for where they are and their part in all of this. The play runs at the Warehouse Theatre in Winnipeg until March 14th. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Looks good. We were supposed to go to that opening night. I Missed know. Out. Too what bad. Happened? You went away. Oh, that's right. That's your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. And join us tomorrow afternoon live at 3 p.m. Eastern Time when we'll be putting resource work camps, commonly known as man camps, in focus. I'm Melissa Ridge and have a good night. And I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Face to Face is next. See you back here tomorrow.